we come to John chapter 8, beginning here now at verse uh, 31, it's good to sort of set the setting for ourselves. Jesus is on the Temple Mount. It's probably the day right after the Feast of Tabernacles. There is still sort of a feast-sized crowd in Jerusalem. He's teaching to a number of people there. We don't know how many. The text doesn't tell us. In my mind, I envision 50, 100, 150 There's common people listening to him there up on the Temple Mount, but there's also religious leaders. There's this combination of people who believe and people who are hostile towards him. And we're going to see voices and references to both those who believe and those who are hostile towards him in our text. But there's one thing I want you to look in the big picture from what we cover here to the end of the chapter, and it's simply this, that Jesus is attacked terribly in this text that we're going to take a look You can hardly believe the things they're going to say to him. Yet there's a sense of calm and peace in the way that Jesus responds. He doesn't blow up. He doesn't get angry. But he speaks with calm, passionate truth towards those who oppose and accuse him. Let's take a look here. Beginning now at verse 31. It says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now notice first and foremost, verse 31 says that he said this to those Jews who believed in him. The previous verse, you can just glance at it, verse 30 of John chapter 8 in your Bibles. It says that many believed in him. And Jesus spoke here to those people who had the beginnings of belief in him. In other words, their belief was genuine, but it was just at the beginning. And and it's a very important place to understand that somebody's faith can be in Jesus Christ, true, real, it's a genuine faith, but it's just a beginning faith, and it has to progress on from that point. So Jesus is speaking to those who believe, but they believe with this very elementary beginning. They've made the first step towards faith and discipleship of Jesus Christ. And now he tells them what they have to do to make the other steps. He says in verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Friends, would you just look at that verse for a moment? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are going to be disciples of Jesus Christ... If we're going to be those who follow him and claim a commitment to him, if we, and isn't it, I hope I'm not exaggerating to say, you should not call yourself a Christian unless you consider yourself to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Fair fair enough? If you consider yourself a Christian to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, notice what he says is a prerequisite here. He says you must abide in his word. There's no other way. You see, to be a follower of Jesus, who is the word made flesh, is to abide, that is to live in, to dwell in, to make your home in his word. I think it's just appropriate time for me to speak just very pointedly about the concept of Christians reading their Bibles. Isn't this very elementary? If you want to be his disciple, you have to abide in his word. You should read the Bible. Because when Jesus said his word, I don't think he only meant the red letters in your Bible edition. I think he meant the entirety of his word. You need to read your Bible and you need to think about what you read. His word has to abide in you. Sometimes his word is just like a bird that flies through our mind almost in one ear and out the other, so to speak. But Jesus said, no, if you're going to be my disciple, you need to abide, live in, dwell in, immerse yourself in my word. Friends, all all I can tell you is that it's proven both now and all throughout history, and I'm sure it'll be proven until the day Jesus Christ returns, That when those who claim to follow Jesus Christ are ignorant of his word and separated from his word, the church is weak and the work of God seems enveloped by darkness. But when individual believers say, no, this word has to abide in me. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to let it dwell in me. 
then there's something powerful about God's work. Now, b- believe me, I'm so grateful that each and every one of you are here. I just kind of always get amazed that people show up and that, you know, here I am to speak, and there are people who at least, at least it, it, if you're not listening, you're doing a good job of faking it, and I applaud you for that. <laughs> but here's the, the, the pastor's fear. The pastor's fear is, this is the only time you read your Bible. And it's a good time, and I'm glad you're here, but it needs to be more than this. You need to make the reading of the Bible and the thinking upon the Bible a regular part of your life. Why? Well, because you claim to be a Christian. Let me just say it again. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Matter of fact, we could sort of draw a principle from this. Here's the principle. Belief is the beginning, but abiding is essential. What do I mean by that? Well, these were all people, he spoke this to those who believed in him. That's great. They had this elementary first step of belief. But Jesus says, okay, you believed in me, great. Now what you need to do is you need to abide in me and in my word. If you don't, if you don't, then you're not truly my disciple. The true followers of Jesus are shown because they keep his word. Now, there are some people who say, and I kind of understand why people say this. I'm not, I'm not completely unsympathetic to the person who says, who are you to say somebody's a Christian and somebody's not a Christian? Well, you know what? Who am I to say it? I'm just me. Forget about my opinion. But, but can't we say that Jesus Christ has the authority to say who's a Christian and who's not a Christian? Can't, can't we at least give to Jesus that authority? And what does Jesus say? He says very plainly, I'll just read it again. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now, friends, Jesus has this authority. And you know one of the wonderful things about that is, think about it in these terms, is that there have been both in the modern age and throughout history people who have committed atrocities in the name of Jesus. Now, can they rightfully claim to be Christians? Can I just read you a verse? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If somebody's actions are so far out of the character of Jesus, then whatever they're doing, they're not doing it as a Christian. And it's fair enough to say, no, you can't lay that one on Jesus. You can't lay that one on the followers of Jesus Christ because this one has proven, they've demonstrated that they don't abide in his word. Now look at the great benefit from this, verse 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Friends, this is the great result of abiding in the word of Jesus. We prove ourselves to be his disciples, and we know the truth. By the way, I love how Jesus phrases it. It's very, very kind of contrary to the spirit of our present age, but because the spirit of the present age would say something like this. You would know your truth. But Jesus doesn't say you will know your truth. He says you will know the truth. Friends, the idea that there is an objective truth in spiritual things, that when it comes to spiritual things, some things are true and some things are false, it runs very much against the spirit of our age, but it's what Jesus says very plainly. And how do we know the truth? By abiding in his word, demonstrating that we are his disciples indeed, then we know the truth, and what's the great benefit from that? The truth shall make you free. God works his freedom in our life through his truth. Maybe if you need more freedom in your life, what you really need is more truth. You need to immerse yourself into the word and the power and the goodness of God. See, this is what I want you to understand. When you give yourself to abiding in God's word, and let me just be very practical with you for a minute. You say, well, David, how much do I need to read my Bible? Do I need to read my Bible every day? How long do I need to read my Bible for? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? You know, you want me to make you a whole list of rules and this and that. Let's just keep it very basic. How about this? Whatever you do right now, do more. (laughs) No, three days a week, I spend seven minutes a day reading my Bible. Okay, why don't you make it four days a week? You spend 15 minutes a day reading your Bible. Whatever you do right now, do a little more. But understand this when you do it. Do it in faith. What do I mean by that? Understanding that the operation of the word of God is more than intellectual. That God does an actual spiritual in your life 
in your new man or new woman that's created in Jesus Christ as you give attention to the word. He's doing things. He's cleansing you. He's strengthening you. He's equipping you. He's giving you his grace, his mercy, his love. He's doing spiritual work inside of you as you give attention to his word. So how long do you want him to give that spiritual attention to you? How often during the week? Well, I, I think as much as you practically can. All right, continuing on, verse 33. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we, you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now notice this, Jesus spoke about the freedom that came from abiding in his word. Look at the response from the religious rulers in verse 33. With anger, they responded and said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Notice this. Jesus gives them the offer of freedom in his word. And by being a disciple to him, here it is, religious leaders, the offer of freedom. And you know what their response was? Their response wasn't, was not... Oh, Jesus, thank you for it. Can you tell us more about this freedom? We want this. Teach us more. You know what their response was? Forget you, Jesus. We're good. Isn't that largely the response of the normal, everyday person to the offer of freedom in Jesus Christ? It's usually not hostile. It's usually like, get away from me, you filthy Christian. Sometimes Christians kind of build up a persecution complex and act like people are against us more than they actually are. But it's not that. Usually the response is very similar to that which the religious leaders did right now. Hey, Jesus, whatever, great. We're good. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Which, by the way, historically speaking, was kind of a crazy thing for them to say. I won't get on. It was a crazy thing for them to say this. But anyway, they, we're good. We don't need it. And look at how Jesus responds. He says this in verse 34, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, I need to make something clear here. As far as the original grammar and wording of this, sin in this passage is a verb tense indicating a habitual continual action. Jesus doesn't mean that if you occasionally sin, you're a slave of sin. But what he's talking about is that if you repeatedly sin, you're a slave to that sin. And isn't that clear? It doesn't really matter what the sin is. The, the, the sin could be lying about your golf score. <laughs> now, friends, on, this, on the scale of sins, isn't that a fairly small sin? But you know what? If you can't play a round of golf without lying about your score, you're a slave to that sin. Now, you sort of a humorous example, but should I go through a punch list of much more painful examples? about the addictions, about the immoralities, about the shames that hold us in its grasp? Friends, I don't need to do that. I think the Holy Spirit speaks that to your heart right now. How we look around our society today, how we see it sometimes amongst our own community, people who are utter slaves to sin. And that's what Jesus was saying to these guys. You guys say you're fine, but you are slaves to sin. And what sins were they slaves to? Friends, these were religious leaders. These weren't guys who were going out and partying and getting drunk every night. These weren't guys who were committing sexual immorality. These weren't guys that had kind of the obvious sins that everybody likes to point out. You know what their sins were? were? Where they were in slavery to sin? They were in slavery to sin because they wouldn't stop rejecting Jesus. They wouldn't stop hating him. They wouldn't stop pushing Jesus away and trying to oppose him. That was their greatest sin. And Jesus said, you guys are slaves to that sin. You need to be set free. And look at the freedom. Verse 36, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Friends, if we're set free from our slavery to sin, we need to be set free by a Son and by uh, abiding in Jesus and being in his uh, word as disciples. Then we are free indeed. Then we have a true freedom that contrasts with the pretended freedom that they just claimed. That's what Jesus called them. That's what Jesus made plain. 
But friends, again, if we just want to draw out another very concrete principle from this that we can just camp on just for a moment, you see it right there in this verse, the principle, that sin makes slaves, the sun sets free. Being ignorant of your slavery won't take it away. Denying your slavery won't take it away. What you need to do to be set free of your slavery is you need to come to a son, Jesus Christ, the son who will set you free. You know what? It's no use going to another slave. You need to go from somebody who's outside the system, somebody who can come and free you from the outside of the prison door. Friends, that's how it is for you and I. The sun sets us free. Slavery makes sense. The sun sets free. And this is what you need to understand, and very plainly, is this offer goes out today. You know, when we talk about the slavery of sin, I wouldn't doubt if there's at least a few people that go, that's me. Look at me. I can't stop doing this. Maybe nobody around you knows it, but you know it and God knows it. I can't stop doing this. I swore to myself a a dozen times I'd stop. I'd stop. I'd stop. I can't stop. In this regard, you say, I am a slave to sin. Friends, right now, the sun is here to set you free. Isn't that beautiful? Because just as it's true, you're a slave to sin. And let's not sugarcoat it. You're a slave to that sin. Just as much as that's true, it is true that the Son can set you free. So believe in him today and look to him for that freedom. Continuing on, verse 37, Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Stopping in the middle there, verse 41. Now Jesus says, listen, I know you guys are descended from Abraham. But here's the difference. You're descended from Abraham genetically, but you're not descended from Abraham spiritually. By the way, let me just say very quickly... In the Bible, both concepts have their place and have their importance. God has an ongoing plan through the scriptures, past, present, and future, for the genetic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people. He's not finished with them. They have a very critical role in his plan. God is not finished with the Jewish people as the Jewish people. That's the genetics end of it. But we also recommend, or recognize this, that the Bible doesn't just teach the concept of genetic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It also teaches the idea of the spiritual descendants. You know what's great? You can be a spiritual descendant of Abraham without having a drop of Jewish blood in your body. Because being a spiritual descendant of Abraham is granted on the basis of faith. Abraham was a man of faith. And so if you're going to be a man of faith or a woman of faith, you follow in the footsteps of Abraham. And if you're really like that, you're going to accept Jesus. You see, they look back to Abraham as their father. Abraham welcomed the word of God, the messengers of God, the work of God. These men were rejecting it. So Jesus uh, spoke very plainly to them. And he said, you do the deeds of your father. Did you see that in the middle of verse 41? Now, he didn't say who their father was. Just wait. He'll get to that a little bit later. But pick it up in the middle of verse 41 now. We read. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come from myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Look at it there, friends. In verse 41... They made this remarkable statement. We were not born of fornication. Friends, do you understand how they mean that? They are implying we weren't Jesus, you were. You expect us to believe those stories about a virgin birth? Sure, Jesus, we've heard the rumors. We heard that it was a Roman soldier who was actually your biological father. Now, those are just tales, those are just stories. But do you see what their contrast they're trying to draw? 
Jesus, you were born of fornication. We were not. They're insulting Jesus pretty heavily right here. But notice what Jesus says in response, verse 42. If God were your father, you'd love me. Again, he makes the remarkable claim that he and his father are so close that, that, that if one truly lives as if God is their father, they are going to love the son as well. That, that there's no room left for the person who says, says, says this. I love God, but I reject Jesus. Friends, there's no room left for that. Because Jesus is the perfect representation of God the Father. So if you love God, you're also going to accept the Son. This is what I want you to understand. Don't you realize that Jesus' pain in dealing with the religious leaders, it wasn't personal. It's not like Jesus says, oh, I wish you fellows would like me. There's nothing of that in this. He recognizes the seriousness of their rejection of him because when they rejected him, they were really rejecting God, their Father in heaven. And this mattered everything. So then he continues on, verse 44. Now, he just made a reference to them being of their father, that their father wasn't Abraham. Now he's going to take off the gloves in verse 44 and just be very plain with them. Ready? Fasten your seatbelt. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Wow, did Jesus just drop a bomb on them in verse 44? Guys, let me tell you here, um, I know you're really impressed with your whole religious thing. Here you are, you're leaders of the nation, religiously speaking. You got the priesthood, you got the degrees, you got the recognition, you got the acclaim. But let me just shoot with you straight. Verse 44, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He says, if you're going to bring up the issue of parentage, you can say, we were not born of fornication. Let me tell you about your parentage. Spiritually speaking, you are of your father, the devil. I'm tempted, I'm going to resist the temptation, but I'm tempted to just go off on a long explanation about the devil and to speak about how the Bible says that the devil's real. We're not talking about a guy in red tights and a pitchfork. We're talking about a malevolent spiritual being of a lot of power and a lot of intelligence who actively opposes God's work and apparently has thousands, if not millions, of other spiritual beings at his command coordinated to try to do his work in the world to resist God and to attack God's people. There is a real devil. And Jesus said to those religious leaders, to the religious leaders, it's as if he's saying this to a pastor's conference, you are of your father, the devil. That's a heavy bomb to drop on these guys, but I just want to point out, friends, um, if it is a very heavy thing to say that somebody is of their father, the devil, the good news is, they didn't have to stay that way. The Bible doesn't say this. Well, listen, you're, you're, you're living your life for the devil, whether you realize it or not. You're living your life to the devil, and there's nothing you can do about it. There you are. You're in the devil's family. Forget it. That's where you started. That's where you're ending. You're hopeless. The Bible never presents it in that sense. The good news of the Scriptures is simply this. You can change your family. It's a heavy thing to say your father is the devil, but it's great freedom to say you can come into a better family if you want to. You, you need your new family. Friends, your new family needs you as well. That's what the Bible says. There's a family of the devil and there's a family of God. And when people knowingly or unknowingly are living their life for the devil and his purposes, friends, what a mess that is but what freedom it is in God to say, you come on over into a better family. Here's the family of God. The gates are wide open for you. 
but they didn't. Verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. They rejected Jesus because he told them the truth they didn't want to hear. It wasn't because he spoke lies. Matter of fact, it says there in verse 47, you do not hear because you are not of God. Jesus pressed on the point of spiritual parentage. It's evident by your actions. If you were really of God, you wouldn't reject me the way you're rejecting me. Now verse 48, then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me and do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. The religious leaders were furious that they answered back. You're a Samaritan, meaning you're a heretic. You're a devil, meaning you're demon-possessed. Jesus says, no. If I was demon-possessed, would I honor my father the way? Listen, one thing you can say about the devil is that he doesn't give honor to God. And Jesus says, look at the way that I give honor to my father. And the way that I give honor to my father shows that I am not a a Samaritan that is a heretic. That's the sense in which they met it. Nor am I demon-possessed. Now verse 51, Jesus says, most assuredly. By the way, I love how Jesus doesn't back off a bit. He steps it up each way. He's going to step it up again here in verse 51. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets are dead? Whom do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus made another remarkable claim that only God alone can make or say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Friends, again, this is what I want you to understand. I can't tell you how much, as we go through the Gospel of John, I'm overwhelmed with this for a new time again and again. Just the simple truth that Jesus claimed to be God. Now, you might disagree and say he wasn't God. Fine, you have the right to disagree. But please don't try to tell me that Jesus didn't claim to be God. He thought he was God. Because he said something that Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, would never say. King David or Abraham or or Moses, none of those guys would ever say. He said, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. My word. Making his word equivalent with the word of God. They totally freaked out when Jesus said that, verse 52. Now we know you have a demon. And then they said in verse 53, are you greater than Abraham? Now, Jesus is going to answer that question, is he greater than Abraham? But notice what he says first, starting at verse 54. Jesus answered and said, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, then I should be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Jesus saying, listen, I know, I'm fine with my relationship with God. I know my own relationship with the Father. That's not in question here. But let me answer your question asking if I am greater than our father Abraham starting now at verse 56, Jesus says. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, what possibly did he mean by that? I'll tell you what the religious leaders thought he meant by that. Look at the next verse. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why did they pick up stones to stone him? Because they understood that Jesus claimed to be God. Now notice how he begins this little section. First of all, he says, verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Listen, um, I I was around when Abraham was. Abraham understood all about me, the Messiah. And again, their, their minds are bent by this. Verse 57, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. What are you talking about, Jesus? How can you claim that you've seen Abraham? Now, it's interesting that they make the reference to Jesus not being yet 50 years old. We know that from the Gospel of Luke that Jesus was about 30 when he began his ministry. And some people think that the claim 50 years old, that it's just throwing out a round number, and that's possible, isn't it? But isn't it possible also that Jesus looked older than his 30 years? 
maybe the weight of his responsibilities, the weight of what he carried upon, maybe, and this is a huge maybe, I'm just throwing it out as a suggestion, maybe it made him look a little bit older than he actually was. In any regard, he makes this dramatic statement in verse 58, before Abraham was, I am. Friends, with this very dramatic phrase, Jesus told them that he was eternal God, existing not only during the time of Abraham, but through all eternity. He used the same phrasing that God used to speak to Moses out of the burning bush. Jesus said, I am the voice from the burning bush. I am Yahweh. I am the covenant God of Israel. I am. Now, friends, why do I keep stressing this so much? I don't blame you if you're thinking, man, would he get off this Jesus is God stuff? We get it already. I just want to explain a very practical importance for you and I about that. Our slavery to sin is so deep that we need God to rescue us. You see, only Jesus, God the Son, is enough to rescue us. We need more than good advice from a human leader. We need more than than wisdom from the ages. You need more than a how-to book. You need God himself to come and rescue you. And he has in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. Now, when we understand the greatness of our need, then we understand We need a divine savior. A human guidepost isn't enough. You know, wisdom of the ages isn't enough. As I said before, a how-to book isn't enough. We need God himself to come and save us. Now, they didn't like the answer. That's why it says there in verse 59, then they took up stones to throw at him. They understood perfectly. I... I I read scholars who disbelieve what Jesus says here. They try to make it sound like Jesus never claimed to be God. You know what I think is funny about that? The people who heard him at the moment perfectly understood him. They perfectly understood what Jesus said. So it says they pick up stones. On the Temple Mount, they were still in construction. I'm sure they picked up stones that were around from the construction site because Herod was still building the temple in Jesus' day. But then what does it say? Notice what it says in verse 59. Jesus hid himself and went out through the temple, going through the midst of them. They wanted to kill Jesus, but they couldn't because his hour had not yet come. And it just says that some way he passed through the midst. Some people wonder if this was a miracle. I read some commentators say that Jesus made himself invisible. I don't, maybe they believe in the ninja Jesus or something like that. I don't quite get it. You know, like, woo, I'm invisible. Like Jesus with a superpower or something like that. No, it didn't work. I don't know how it worked exactly, but Jesus just went out and they did not lay a hand or a stone upon him. But friends, do you see how important it was to Jesus to reveal himself to them as God? Let, let me just wrap up right here with just reminding, I'll just read these to you. Four takeaways from this morning. Ready for this? First of all, belief is the beginning Abiding is essential. Do you remember that emphasis on abiding in his word? Then you are his disciples indeed. Secondly, notice it, that sin makes slaves. don't, Don't make any mistake about it. The bait you're going after has a hook on it. And the hook is the slavery to sin. Do you think the devil has ever tempted a single person and say, hey, come be a slave to sin? No, it's look at the bait, here's the hook. But the sun sets free. Sin makes slaves. The sun sets free. Uh, Thirdly, you can change your family. That's the good news. Listen, friends, we're born messed up, but God gives us the invitation to come in his family. And then finally, only Jesus, God the Son, is enough. We need God to rescue us, and he has drawn near to do it in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, that's what we pray for. Lord, and I want to pray in particular this this morning for people who feel in the bondage to sin. Lord, I can imagine there's probably some people it's completely secret to anybody else, but right now they would just confess before you they are in bondage to sin. And Jesus, all I can say is I pray that you would help them to cry out to you 
so that you would set them free as the Son of God can set free. I pray that you'd help them to never look to self, to, to never look to their own abilities, but Lord, rather to look unto you and to you alone. Father, do this. Pour out your grace and your spirit among us. We receive your word. We receive you, Jesus, the Son of God and God the Son. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.